Hello Aviator, Sky here, and today we continue to learn how to transport cargo by air. Our today's hero is perhaps one of the most famous military transport planes, a machine that has seen it all during the years of service, from impressive humanitarian missions to chaotic evacuations from horrifying war zones. This aircraft has already been retired, but it still has a lot to tell us. So let's salute the veteran. The C-141 Starlifter is a heavy military strategic airlifter that was created by the Lockheed Company in the early 1960s and served in the US Air Force up until the beginning of the 21st century. Being the first jet-powered heavy airlifter, the C-141 had successfully replaced most of its predecessors and it set the foundation for a new evolutionary stage of this part of the industry. The 1950s and the 1960s happened to be the time of a large-scale rearrangement of the entire aviation industry, when piston planes were being rapidly pushed aside by their turboprop and jet descendants. Obviously, the military transport aviation followed suit and had also gone along with this trend, and this change was even more relevant for the US military air transport service. The guys from MATS, who were in charge of cargo transport for the Air Force, were facing quite a complicated situation as they already had an enormous fleet of airlifters which all of a sudden became obsolete. These had to be replaced with completely new machines whose creation turned out to be an equally complex task. In 1956, Douglas took into the sky their flagship transport plane, the C-155 Cargo Master, which was considerably superior to its predecessors but did not become a universal remedy. These were quite complex and expensive machines that required a lot of attention and improvements, and they did not shine with safety. These factors limited both their delivery volumes and the extent of their use. Besides, the Cargo Masters were powered by turboprop engines, which limited their cruise speed to just 281 knots or 520 km per hour. It was a big deal, since already by the 1960s jet engines were showcasing their advantages, and particularly their speed. The military wanted to get a plane that would be easier to maintain, would be more versatile and, what's most important, they wanted a plane that would fly faster. The first solution to this problem was the Boeing C-135 Stratolifter, a freighter version of the legendary Progenitor, the prototype 367-80, which would become the starting point for many large Boeings, including the Boeing 707 airliner. The Stratolifter was quite a decent machine, it was reliable, it was spacious, and most importantly it was fast. Besides, to a large extent, it was unified with the KC-135 aerial tanker, so the Air Force had an easier time operating it. In the end, MATS got 48 airlifters of this model, all of which were actively used. However, in spite of all its advantages, the C-135 was still an incomplete solution. These planes were demanding in regard to airfields, their fuselage would sit too high above the ground, while the loading and unloading process had to be carried out through side doors, because the C-135 did not have ramps. This meant that working with bulky cargo would be almost impossible, and neither would it be possible to carry out airborne operations. As a result, in 1960, the US Air Force had initiated the development program of an entirely new airlifter that would be able to get everything done efficiently. It had to be a jet-powered plane capable of flying 3,500 miles, 6,500 kilometers, with a payload of 60,000 pounds or 27 tons. At the same time, it had to be undemanding to airfield infrastructure and be able to carry out airborne operations, be it with cargo or paratroopers. Boeing, General Dynamics and Lockheed took part in this tender, while Douglas preferred to stay aside as they were already completely busy with their transport plane. Lockheed got down to business with fervor. On the one hand, they already had a successful experience with military transport planes. At least the C-130 Hercules was showing some excellent performance. On the other hand, the new plane was much larger than the Hercules, and besides, it had to be jet-powered, which basically made it the first of its kind at the time. Dubbed as Model 300, the project had a configuration that resembled a lot of the new airlifters of that time a low-sitting fuselage with a squatty landing gear, and a high wing with engines. Obviously, it had to have a large cargo door in the back. The military loved the project, and in 1961, the Pentagon selected it as the winner of the tender. 
Fun fact, the first document signed by the President John F. Kennedy after his inauguration was the procurement contract for the Lockheed airlifters. This transport plane was officially called C-141 Starlifter, a combination of the usual military index, Lockheed's passion for the word star, and the fact that it was a lifter. The contract included the creation of five prototypes for testing purposes, and the guys from Lockheed went an extra mile to deliver the first prototype as soon as 1963, just three years after the beginning of the program. That year, a rollout ceremony of the C-141A prototype was celebrated at the Marietta plant in Georgia, which is where the mass production would take place. Well now, let's take a closer look at the airplane they had created. In terms of overall configuration, the C-141 Starlifter can be regarded as a classic, heavy military transport plane. The fuselage had a rather simple shape with a circular cross-section, and it features four main doors, one in front for the crew, two behind the wing for the paratroopers, and the large one with a ramp, which was obviously meant for cargo. Naturally, the aft section of the fuselage was a bit elevated, in order to free up the loading area from the empennage structures. Speaking of empennage, it had a T-tail with a large horizontal stabilizer. The solution was deemed to be quite successful, and this configuration is still used on all American heavy lifters, in one way or another. The airplane was fitted with a slightly swept high wing, with a span of 160 feet, or 48.8 meters. The high lift devices were classic as well. Each console featured ailerons, huge expandable flaps, and spoilers, but no slats were used in this plane. The guys from Lockheed learned from the mistakes Douglas made with their C-133 and kept them in mind when they were creating the Starlifter. In the construction of the airframe, they used special aluminum alloys that were more resistant to micro-cracking, while the critical areas were reinforced with titanium patches. The power plant was made up of four Pratt Whitney TF-33 turbofans, each of which was providing 93 kilonewtons of thrust. Actually, these are a military version of the JT-3D engine. Thanks to this choice of engines, the C-141 was easy to operate. The US Air Force already had a lot of other planes with these engines, including all the versions of the Boeing 135 and the B-52 bombers. These engines were rather reliable and efficient. With their help, the C-141A could reach a speed of about 493 knots, had a range of 3600 miles or 6600 kilometers when fully loaded, and it had a ferry range of up to 5400 miles. As expected in an airlifter, the landing gear was very low, which allowed to place the entrance into the cargo bay sitting just 50 inches above the ground. The main gear had four-wheeled bogies that were attracted into the fairings on the sides of the fuselage. Speaking of which, the left fairing also stored the auxiliary power unit. The nose landing gear was classic, with just two wheels. The usual crew consisted of five people, two pilots, a flight engineer, a navigator, and a cargo operator. The cargo bay of the basic C-141A was 3 meters or 10 feet wide, 2.7 meters or 9 feet high, and 21 meters or 70 feet long. The reinforced structure allowed it to carry quite a wide range of cargo. Obviously, the heavier was the payload, the less fuel could be carried, and the shorter was the range. The usual payloads on this plane reached 32 tons or 70,000 pounds, and these could consist of both military equipment and people up to 154 soldiers, 123 fully equipped paratroopers, or 80 stretchers for wounded, plus medics. Of course, there were also special freights. For instance, the cargo bay of the C-141 was reinforced in order to carry the LGM-30 Minuteman ballistic missiles, whose weight along with their containers reached 42 tons. In fact, in this instance, the guys from Lockheed had even taken things a bit too far with the reinforcement, or did not go far enough with the dimensions. Actual practice had shown that the operators were mostly limited by the dimensions of the cargo bay, rather than by its payload capacity. In December of 1963, the plane made its maiden flight. The five test planes were actively used by both Lockheed and the MATS personnel. The deliveries began in 1965, and in the end, instead of the planned 132 planes, the Pentagon had extended the order up to 284 aircraft. 
It was one fine plane, and the Vietnam War boosted the need for air bridges. The entire batch was delivered already in 1968, in just three years. Considering the circumstances, there was no time for contemplation, and the C-141s were immediately sent to carry out their missions. Ironically, the issue of the cargo bay being not large enough had emerged almost immediately, and the military had no choice other than to use the C-124 Globemaster II when they needed to carry bulky cargo. In the end, the final solution basically came only with the advent of the C-5 Galaxy. However, the Starlifter did successfully accomplish most of its missions, and it received its baptism by fire in Vietnam, where it got the respect of its operators. It became even more famous after the large-scale evacuation of the American forces and refugees from the besieged Saigon at the dawn of the war. That was not the most glorious episode in US history, but the plane had shown its worth. The C-141 Starlifter fleet had basically become the basis of the US military transport aviation from the 1960s up until the 1990s, and it took part in practically every large-scale operation within that period of time. As a result, by 1975, each plane had already an average of 20,000 flight hours. Oddly enough, during that time, the military, both American and foreign, had changed their minds about the jet airlifters. While in 1960s they were convinced that turboprops were just a temporary solution, by mid-70s it turned out that, in many regards, the turboprops were better than jets, at least in the middleweight segment. So, while the C-133 Cargo Master was sent to the scrapyard without regrets, the good old C-130 Hercules is still flying, and it does not even think of ceding the way to its jet counterparts. Of course, some of the key advantages of turboprop airlifters were the possibility of keeping the costs rather low, and their ability to land on unpaved airfields more softly. In such conditions, the C-141 would land harder, which would lead to all sorts of problems, from the mundane pavement damage to a faster wear and tear of the airframe. The wing and the central section would take most of the damage, and their condition was already concerning by the end of the 1970s. The maintenance and repairs were starting to be insufficient. By then, the Air Force had already initiated a modernization program for their C-141 fleet, with the goal of both improving their performance and solving the wear-out issues. Lockheed took advantage of this opportunity and proposed to go even further with the update by introducing more substantial changes into the airframe. In the end, they replaced all the worn-out components with new ones, updated the onboard systems, added the air refueling systems, and solved the issue of an excessively small cargo bay by stretching the fuselage by 23 feet, more than 7 meters. This is how the C-141B was born. In fact, the modernization would not imply the delivery of new batch of planes, but precisely the modernization of the existing ones. This is what had been done between 1979 and 1982, with 270 planes, which was almost the entire fleet of those planes that were operated at the time. After the modernization, these planes kept on flying intensively up until the mid-90s, when the tear and wear issues came back after the Desert Storm operation. These airlifters were flown to such an extent that their lifespan was getting close to an end. The military even had to limit the maximum allowed payload on these planes, while Lockheed suggested to carry out yet another series of modernizations in order to extend their life. But the Pentagon was not in a hurry anymore. The Cold War was over, and all of a sudden there was much less work to do for the strategic transport planes. There were budget reductions, and the Starlifter's successor, the C-17 Globemaster III, was about to get approved for operational service. In any case, no one was going to carry out the likes of the large-scale works that were needed to upgrade the A version to B. A modernization program was finalized in the end of the 1990s, but it consisted only of small improvements and the replacement of avionics with the inclusion of a glass cockpit. Now these planes could be piloted by a crew of two. As a result, 63 Starlifters were modestly upgraded to become the C-141C. Another 13 aircraft were modified as part of the SOL, Special Operation Low Level Project, which made them capable of carrying out low-altitude airdrop missions in contested zones of both equipment and paratroopers. However, these were already highly specialized airplanes, which were mostly used by special forces. In terms of incident rates, the C-141 were not the culprit of safety, but they were rather good nevertheless. 
Over the entire lifespan, only 21 units were lost out of the 284 that were delivered. When looking at these figures, you need to keep in mind that they flew for several decades in quite harsh conditions. Of course, the aviators fiddled around with these planes more than I have just told you. What's interesting is that right from the start of the project in the 1960s, Lockheed was creating a plane that was meant not only for the military, they also had their eye on the civil commercial market. For this purpose, they developed the L-300 Super Starlifter version, without the military equipment, with a stretched fuselage, and fitted with the usual civilian onboard equipment. A few cargo operators got interested in the project, but unfortunately for Lockheed, they could not succeed in this field. After all, military transport is quite a specific thing, and consequently, even with all the modifications, it turned out to be way too complex to operate, and was not economically efficient for the civil market. Besides, the problem of the cargo bay dimensions was even more acute here. While in most cases the military had rather small but at the same time very heavy cargo, on the civil market things would usually be the other way around. The cargo was not all that heavy, but it was bulky. As a result, they just could not compete with freighter versions of airliners. So in the end, Lockheed assembled one prototype, tested it, and then decided to abandon the project and gave the plane to NASA. NASA did accept the plane with arms wide open, and for several decades it was used to carry out lots of experiments. Eventually, the plane was converted into a flying observatory, with a telescope installed in its fuselage. It would make a lot of flights up until the mid-90s as the Kuiper Airborne Observatory. Now, the skies are observed by its successor, the Boeing 747SP, fitted with an infrared telescope, the renowned Sophia Stratosphere Observatory. Of course, the experimental aviators would not be themselves if they did not create something truly outstanding. This outstanding would be the Eclipse project that was carried out between 1997 and 1998. The idea was to get a military transport plane, the C-141 to be precise, to tug along another, smaller airplane and save its fuel. You might ask, what's so special about it? Haven't you ever seen a glider? Yes, but here, instead of a glider, they had an F-106 Delta Dart fighter, in the form of the QF-106 drone. And it actually flew. This idea could grow into something even bigger. In fact, the aviators contemplated the possibility of using this method to lift a small carrier rocket that would be air-launched, something like Spaceship 2 or Stargazer on a leash. But this was not meant to happen. As you may imagine, all this fun with the Stratolifters could not last forever. They quit NASA, and they also quit the US Air Force. By 2004, the C-141 was basically retired and sent out to storage. By 2020, all the planes have been decommissioned. About 15 of them are now standing on static expositions in aviation museums, while the remainder was stored at the Davis Mountain Mega Parking in Arizona or simply cut in pieces. This is the story of one of the most prominent military airlifters in the world. Write down in the comments what you think about this jolly plane that has seen so much. And subscribe to the channel. Fast flights and soft landings to you.